now let's turn to a subject that you, you know very well because you, you conducted a, a study uh, on, that, on that subject. So the, the application of IHL to international organizations. So I'm sure that you will say that IHL applies to, to international organizations, but what, which, on which legal basis? And, and, and uh, after that, what are the, the legal developments which are needed in this field? Now, first of all, are international organizations bound by IHL? This question would have been embarrassing 30 or 40 years ago because at that time the law pertaining to the personal scope of application of IHL was clearly underdeveloped and highly uncertain. Uh, what was customary was an under-discussed matter. The question was dominated by conventional law. And as you know, the conventions are open to ratification and accession only for states. They expressly say so in the accession clauses. Sometimes the term power appears, which is just a self-serving, a, a way to express the thing in a narcissistic way for states because they like themselves very much. And also they consider that there are powers. It's a nice way for them to express their own supremacy. But states are parties to these conventions. Hence it was doubtful whether international organizations were bound by IHL. And if you take the most important international organization for issues of maintenance of peace, namely the United Nations, as you all know, the United Nations denied for many years to be obliged by IHL with several arguments. The first of, of these arguments being we are not belligerents. We are not a party to the conflict. IHL uh, applies to the parties to the conflict. We are not there to be a party to the conflict. We are there to maintain the peace. And therefore, IHL is not a matter for us, but for the belligerents. These issues have developed since then. You have now two bases on which international organizations are bound by IHL. The first one is not extremely exciting in the sense that it is a normal way of lawmaking. What is new is just that international organizations now do it, whereas in the past they were not prepared to do it. This way is that international organizations unilaterally accept obligations under IHL by some declaration, by some unilateral binding act. The example which springs immediately to mind at the universal level at least, that you could check that there are similar developments in a series of regional organizations. At the UN, it is the very famous bulletin of the Secretary General for the application of IHL to UN troops, which means essentially operations for the maintenance of peace, peacekeeping operations. In this bulletin, a series of rules coming from the law of international armed conflicts, interestingly, were said to be applicable to troops under UN control. This is a unilateral act. You bind yourselves under a unilateral act of international law, and then these rules become binding of you because you have the power to issue them. The Secretary General had the power to issue this bulletin because he executes the injunctions of the Security Council for setting up the peacekeeping operations under the relevant resolutions and therefore since he is a he, since he's delegated he has the power also to take the necessary measures for implementing and also giving rules to the peacekeeping troops so that's one way to have binding rules for uh, international organizations the second would be to ratify conventions but these conventions are not open for the time being for organizations we would have to change the understanding of the law here and perhaps even to change the conventions at least by subsequent practice for the time this is not really a way which has been favored because there are conventional provisions which the organizations could anyway not apply as such you know, for instance, that you have some provisions in the conventions which suppose the existence of a territory. An international organization has no territory and therefore you would anyway have to find, let's say, uh, different solutions in order to be able to implement such provisions. So that is not on the order of day that you have international organizations becoming parties to these conventions. The third and last way is to be bound by customary international law which would then apply also not only to states but to international organizations also. 
with some differences, because as I told you, there are certain provisions which you cannot just apply as such to an international organization, but you can always find solutions with a small bit of creativity if the organization has no territory, its member states have territories and therefore with a cooperation with the member states you could solve the problems. Now for customary law, there is a new rule which developed in the 90s. That's also something which developed under the pressure of uh, public shocking images coming from Bosnia. And this new rule is that it's the principle of effectiveness as it is sometimes called all the belligerents, all the parties which in one way or the other participate to the armed conflict. And that can also be an international organization through troops which are under double control, UN and some state control. These troops could engage in armed conflict. They could have exchanges of armed type. That's an old standing tradition, by the way. You have, ha you have had that already in the Congo from 1960 to 1964 where the UN troops were engaged in heavy fighting against the secessionist forces. And since then it has occurred regularly that you have had armed encounters between such forces, UN uh, controlled forces, not UN armed forces, these do not exist, but the UN controls these forces through strategic control. And the principle of effectiveness would then just mean if you participate to the game, you participate with the rules of the game. So all those who participate in the armed conflict are thereby automatically bound by the rules of armed conflict. The criterion ratione materiae would then have as a consequence also that the criterion ratione persone is automatically satisfied. This type of criterion has been acknowledged by different uh, entities for armed groups, for instance, more specifically than for international organizations, it was acknowledged very clearly by the Institut de droit international in 1999 in the so-called Sauvage uh, resolution on the applicability of IHL and human rights law to uh, entities which are of a non-state nature. And here uh, can obviously also see in a certain sense international organizations which are non-state entities. To the extent you follow this principle of effectiveness, you could have the application of rules of IHL to international organizations. But that leads me to the second question. The problem is that there remain too many uncertainties. If you take the bulletin of the Secretary General, it is far from being complete. And therefore, in its gaps, in the things it does not mention, there is always a doubt to what extent the UN acknowledges that these rules apply to it. Under customary law on its side, there is the double problem that you have doubts if some rules are customary. You have certain aspects of additional protocol number one, as you know, where you, you are not sure if these rules are customary or not, or perhaps they are clearly not customary, then the problem is settled. And you have the second problem that even if you settle that something is customary, it is not always possible to apply the rule as such to an international organization which is organized differently than a state. The UN again has no territory, it has no prisons, it, can, it cannot itself detain persons under its sole responsibility. It would have to delegate that to a member state but again the problem is then not extremely great. It would have an IHL responsibility when it delegates that power to a member state and it would have a duty of control that the member state abides by the rules which the organization has bound itself to follow. You can therefore always find solutions, but these solutions are not yet sufficiently fine-tuned and accepted and there is creative work to be done before you have a code of the law of armed conflict which clearly sets out which rules apply to the organizations and which rules then perhaps also apply to specific organizations. You could perfectly imagine that you have some rules applying to all as a matter of customary law, but that then organization could go further and accept some additional rules by their own unilateral declarations. So uh, thanks a lot uh, for, for this very interesting development on, on uh, the legal basis, because you go more in depth than in the, than in the, in the course itself that, that that's very very interesting for the students and so thanks a lot for for the future developments that which are needed and i think that we need some uh, research projects on, on that on that issue so now i would like to turn to a very important uh, participant in, in our conflict uh, 
is, uh, I mean, the armed groups. Uh, we know that armed groups, it's, it is not disputed anymore. Uh, armed groups are bound by IHL. But there is uh, controversy about the legal basis, the, the, the legal mechanism upon which they are bound. Uh, there are different theories and we analyze these theories in the, in the course. So in your view, what's, what's the, the, the best theory, if there is a best theory? And how would you consider also, because we know that in practice, armed groups made commitments unilateral declarations or uh, agreements, how do you consider those, those commitments? Are they, are they legal? Uh, do they entail legal obligations uh, or not? Uh, on, on the, at the international level, national level? So what's your, what's your view? That is a difficult question indeed. And let me perhaps say since the inception that on this difficult question there is really no satisfactory legal answer to this day, but to some extent there is. So let us look to the subject matter. We have to separate between customary law and conventional law. On the basis of customary law, or in the perspective of customary law, you can obviously work as, again, the Institut de droit international in the mentioned salvage resolution of 1999 has done, with the principle of effectiveness and consider that these players in an armed conflict are then automatically bound by the rules of the armed conflict. So in a certain sense, if you want to play football, you accept football rules. I take football as an example, not only because I like it, but also because some say that football is just a civilized way to conduct war. Now, having said this, the, the problem starts to become really harder with conventional law. Because in the rules which are conventional in nature, as you know, it's again the same. Those who are bound are the ones who have ratified these rules or have acceded to them. The third parties, for them these rules are, the lawyer says, res inter alios acta. Who ratifies the conventions? Who is bound by the conventions? That are the states, in particular those for non-international armed conflict who have ratified the Geneva Conventions and additional protocol number two, in particular additional protocol number two. It's not that armed groups don't have an importance in international armed conflict, but most often it's the law of non-international armed conflict which applies in that context, because the conflict would then be between state and an armed group, and that is typically a non-international armed conflict. How can you bridge these treaty law problem that the third party who has not signed and ratified the treaty or acceded to it be bound by it. As I told you, a completely satisfactory answer has not been given to that aphorism because it is a clear exception to the basic rules of treaty law and as an exception it is difficult to justify it because the, the, the rule on pacta tertis is an extremely strong rule in international law. The theory which has had most success in this area, as you know, is the one which has been devised by Jean Piquet in the commentaries to the Geneva Conventions under the relevant provisions under Article 3 common. And uh, if you read these commentaries, which are old ones of the 50s, now there is the new commentary. Just some weeks ago uh, there is a new commentary of the ICSC, so you will see the uh, explanation uh, as it has developed in the new, in the new version. The Piquet explanation has varied. If you look into the different commentaries, you don't find exactly the same way of approaching. Basically, however, the way of approaching has remained the same. Which is it? The idea is to say that when the state ratifies these Geneva Conventions or Protocol Number 2, which contains provisions for the application of IHL in the case of a conflict of non-international character between the government and rebel groups, and both must be bound in order to make the protocol working. When the state ratifies, therefore, this treaty, it renders the content of the treaty applicable on its territory. So the whole treaty, once ratified and becoming applicable on the territory, would bind all the persons being on the territory of the state. In a certain sense, it would be a sort of self-executing treaty. It is a treaty which binds directly the single individuals on the territory of the state. It is made for that. That may be individuals with 
which gather together, or who gather together in an armed group much later, 10, 20, 50, 100 years after the ratification of the convention. But the convention would be binding on the territory, on everyone. And when he organizes in an armed group, then he is bound to follow these provisions of the Geneva Convention. That is basically the Pictet explanation. This explanation has been attacked in legal doctrine on several grounds, but it is the only one which you can still follow if you want to explain the phenomenon. However, I must confess that I consider that the matter is not of great practical importance. Because in any case, contrary to the states which have ratified the conventions, the armed groups popping up somewhere on the territory quite never have the faintest knowledge of Geneva Conventions, Article 3, Protocols 2, and so on. Therefore, saying that they are automatically bound to apply these type of provisions may be nice for the lawyer and perhaps for the criminal lawyer, in the sense that then the persons could perhaps be convicted for war crimes. But at the same time, the perspective of IHL is not to have after the fact a criminal conviction. It is to have people following the rules for the benefit of the persons during the armed conflict. And if you want to achieve that, you have to go out there on the terrain and go and see these people, go and see the chiefs of these movements and tell them about the Geneva Conventions and train them and show them that they have something to gain to accept these conventions political respectability or anything else. It is in this way that you can engage these armed groups into the process. That's why also organizations like Geneva Call are extremely useful in popularizing, in disseminating IHL. And that leads me then automatically to the second part of the question, because as long as the armed group is not informed and does not engage itself through a unilateral act, to the applicability of IHL. From the standpoint of IHL, the Pictet explanation remains somewhere in the air. Yes, you can say the people are bound, but if they don't even know that they are, and if they don't even know which the rules are, that will not be helpful for IHL. Again, it may be helpful for criminal convictions after the fact, because you can say you are, you are not entitled to ignore the law. Ignorantia juris nocet, as says the Latin lawyer. But again, from the point of view of IHL, you want to achieve a application of the rules already during the armed conflict. And for that, you must pass through engagements of the group, through unilateral acts, through special agreements, potentially also with the government, recognizing the applicability of this or that rule of the law of armed conflict, and perhaps even rules which come from the law of international armed conflict, you are then not bound to be minimalistic and to say, OK, only Protocol 2 or only Article 3. You can go much further under the argument also that customary law has extended there on conduct of hostilities or other issues. But practically speaking, again, you will need these type of engagements. So we come back to unilateral acts, to unilateral engagements, which are particularly important when you speak about armed groups. The Pictet explanation may be satisfactory to some extent for the lawyer. Practically speaking, it is rather the engagements and the dissemination. Both together, you disseminate and inform. You show these people that it is useful to follow these rules and you have them engaging into these rules to varying extents, going beyond very often the basic rules of uh, the law of non-international armed conflict that you reach an equilibrium which is satisfactory. Oh, yeah. many, many thanks uh, for, for these comments and to emphasize the importance to, to go on the ground to, to, in order that uh, armed groups can, are bound and feel bound by, by IHL and maybe the, all these discussions on the legal basis uh, are um, more part of academic debate than, uh, than really eff effectiveness. So uh, I really thank you for answering that, that question. But very, uh, th those, those answers complement the course and emphasize some aspects of the course.